Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Turkish President Recep Erdogan won a landmark victory in Turkey's national elections. His party and his allies won a majority of the votes and the seats in parliament. Erdogan's victory gives him unprecedented powers as Turkey's president. And some are warning it could signal the end of democracy in Turkey. Turkish President Erdogan hailed his victory as a lesson for how democracy works. Yet the election abolished the office of prime minister, reduced the powers of parliament, and ushered in a new executive presidency that gives Erdogan sweeping new powers. The election represents a 15-year attempt by Erdogan to make himself undisputed ruler of Turkey. Some believe he sees himself as the rightful heir to the Islamic caliphs, who once ruled much of the Muslim world. Erdogan has a vision. He is going to be the, the most important man, the influential man of the Middle East. He would like maybe to be a caliph again. That's what I saw in the Turkish media. Middle East expert Zvi Mazel says Turkey's new presidency is not like the U.S., but one that gives Erdogan a monopoly on power. They will be in charge of all the ministries and all the organization in Turkey. You see? There will not be kind of check and balance, nothing. He's the only one who is going to decide. If the results are confirmed, Erdogan will be from now on a real dictator. Since a failed coup in 2016, Erdogan jailed thousands of his critics, including judges, teachers, civil servants, and journalists. This election gives him expanded powers over the legislature and judiciary, and presents a major challenge to Israel and NATO. It's very grave. Not only that, he bought from Russia the S-400 system, anti-missile anti system. And while he's, like, two days ago, he got the first F-35 from the United States. The big question will be whether or not there will be a, a new opening towards Turkey's Western allies. Uh, a good uh, test of that might very well be the NATO summit that's coming in about two weeks' time in Brussels. Erdogan's allies and enemies reveal his allegiances. He supports the Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas in Gaza. He compared Israel to Nazi Germany when Israeli troops defended their border. Erdogan has also been at the heart of the immigration crisis that has deeply affected Europe. Many of the immigrants who have flooded into Europe came through Turkey. And now immigration from the Islamic world is causing a political earthquake in Europe and threatens the political future of its chief architect, German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Dale Hurd reports that the rebellion against the European Union's immigration policy is spreading. Almost half of Germans now want Chancellor Angela Merkel to resign. Her coalition government could collapse if she doesn't get the right EU agreement restricting the number of migrants entering Germany. President Trump tweeted that the people of Germany are turning against their leadership over migration. Trump was mocked for also tweeting that Germany's crime rate is up, although official figures show it's at a 30-year low. But violent crime in Germany is up, and it's because of migrants. 1,000 Europeans have now been injured or killed in terrorist attacks involving migrants since 2014. And Germany has been targeted with terror plots more than any other European nation, by a wide margin. The rebellion against the European Union's migrant policy has now spread to Italy. Italy's new interior minister says, if someone in Europe thinks that Italy should continue to be a landing point and a refugee camp, they are mistaken. Four of the immigration rebels, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary and Poland, refused to participate in the EU summit on migration. The rebellion has also spread to the grassroots in Sweden, where one poll shows the anti-immigration Sweden Democrats with a clear lead heading towards September elections, with some asking if Sweden is about to have its Trump moment. Sweden's refugee policy has imported crime, terrorism, and a lot of refugees that experts say are uneducated and unemployable. Swedish security expert Magnus Norell. If you live in Stockholm, uh, in, in certain areas of Stockholm, you, you never see this. You don't have to see this. Uh, but in small communities, in smaller cities, you can't avoid it. And that there is where the change will come. And change is coming to a number of nations in Europe. Dale Hurd, CBN News.
Meanwhile, some are wondering if change is coming to Iran. For days, thousands of Iranians marched in the streets of Tehran to protest their government and terrible economic conditions. During the protest, Israeli leaders took the opportunity to speak directly to the Iranian people. Social media video documented the protest. Shopkeepers shut down Tehran's Grand Bazaar. Others filled the streets near Iran's parliament, where police shot tear gas into the crowds. Some shouted, leave Syria, think about us. These demonstrators even shouted, death to Palestine. Mike Ansari of Mohabbat TV told CBN's George Thomas the dissatisfaction of Iranians runs deep. Most Iranian families are facing great economic hardship. The prices of milk, eggs, meat, bread has skyrocketed. Yet Iranian people are witnessing the government investing millions of dollars in expensive, uh, you know, regional disputes uh, in Iraq, Syria, Yemen to increase its regional influence while they're going hungry. Iran's economy is reeling. Prices are rising. The currency is falling and has lost almost half its value in six months. Now the economy is bracing for renewed sanctions after the U.S. pulled out of the nuclear deal with Tehran. In the midst of these demonstrations, Israeli leaders spoke directly to the Iranian people. Israel's defense minister asked them where their money is going, while Prime Minister Netanyahu turned to the World Cup and to soccer. Can you imagine how hard it is to stop Ronaldo from scoring a goal? But the Iranian team just did the impossible. To the Iranian people, I say, you showed courage on the playing field. And today you show the same courage in the streets of Iran. It's unclear where these demonstrations will end up, but some hope they could eventually lead to a regime change. No dictatorship stands for a long period of time, even if they disguise themselves with so-called free election. Uh, it will happen, maybe in a year, maybe in five years, maybe in decades. The question is how much damage this regime would cause until it will disappear from Earth. One day I'll hope to watch Iran's soccer team go head-to-head -head against Israel in a free Tehran. On that day, we'll all be winners. In addition to speaking to the Iranian people, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu also met with Prince William, the Duke of Cambridge. Prince William made history when he became the first British royal to ever visit Israel and the Palestinian areas. Prince William spent much of his trip meeting with regular Israelis and Palestinians, particularly young people. I'm also struck by how many people in the region want a just and lasting peace. This is only too evident among the young people I have met, who long for a new chapter to be written in the history of this region, a chapter which will secure them a prosperous future and will ensure that their enormous talents can flourish. These are not extravagant aspirations, but the same aspirations of young people everywhere in the world. The prince shares a special connection with the Jewish people. His great-grandmother Alice, who is buried on the Mount of Olives, is recognized as a righteous Gentile for saving a family during the Holocaust. The official certificate in our memorial uh, Yad Vashem, yes. which we visited, uh, for uh, Princess Alice, great spirit, great son. The visit also comes at a time when Palestinians are at odds with the U.S. over President Trump's move of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem and a perceived bias in favor of Israel. Prince William's message to Israelis and Palestinians was the same. I know I share a desire with all of you and with your neighbors for a just and lasting peace. The prince visited Jerusalem's old city, prayed at the Western Wall, and met with government leaders. President Reuven Rivlin asked the prince to play a role in communicating with the Palestinian leadership. I would like you to send him a message of peace and tell him it is about time. It is about time that we have to find together the way to build confidence. He got that chance a day later, meeting with Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. I hope it won't be the last visit, and we hope that you will visit us very soon when the Palestinian people get their independence. The British have a long history in the Middle East, and while this is the first royal visit, it's not likely to be the last. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem.
Before the visit of Prince William, the British Embassy created a stir when it called the old city of Jerusalem occupied Palestinian territories. But a new book claims that Israel has a legal right to not only the city of Jerusalem, but the land of Israel under international law. We talk with the author who makes that claim. I'm an international lawyer and a Christian, and I believe that God is bringing his people home to this land as his promise. And I think as Christians, we have the opportunity to be part of what God is doing. As a lawyer, I'm deeply concerned about what is happening to Israel in the international arena and the way that international law is being used to undermine the Jewish state of Israel. So we've written this book to help non-lawyers as well as lawyers to understand how international law works and how uh, we believe that it's being misused in lawfare against Israel. So legally, this is an attack against uh, the legitimacy of Israel? I think so. I mean, I think everything we've seen in the United Nations since certainly the last 40 years, since the Yom Kippur War in 1973, the UN and the European Union, I must say, have become a platform for policies and programs, and particularly I'm thinking of the, the two-state solution, um, which are undermining the Jewish state in different ways. This has been largely from the Arab nations in concert with other blocks of nations. The UN works through blocks and they've used the platform to create resolutions which suggest that somehow this land should be divided. Now, I don't believe it's legally required to divide the land as it's suggested, nor do I think it's a very sensible policy. And one of the main reasons I think it's not very sensible is because it's not going to help the Palestinians. They are not going to be served by having a state created which is not sufficiently governed. One of the biggest problems that the Palestinians have is government. And until you have a strong government and a civil society that grows from bottom up, I don't think you earn statehood. Mm -hmm. What are the parameters that some people use, you know, to argue for a two-state solution? You have a resolution called 2334, which is issued by the Security Council December 2016. Mm -hmm. And that resolution says there shall be a state, Palestinian state. It shall be based on the so-called June 1967 lines. Now these are the armistice lines of 1949, which were created as a ceasefire in the War of Independence in 1948-49. Now those lines run right through the heart of Israel. It's the West Bank and mm -hmm. East Jerusalem. They don't argue why that's the case, but they say this has to be the border. They say also um, that East Jerusalem should be the capital of the state of Palestine. Mm -hmm. And they say that there's nothing in there creating security arrangements for the state of Israel or anything else which would govern the relationship between Israel and that state. Mm -hmm. Is there a deeper context that people are missing or ignoring that, uh, that would I give legitimacy so. to the state of Israel? The paradigm that's being presented to us is an Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This is a conflict apparently between two peoples who have an equal claim to a piece of land. So the logical thing to do is simply to divide it and give it to both, right? The problem with that is I think it's misunderstanding the deeper context of the conflict. This is a conflict really about the existence of the Jewish state of Israel in the Middle East. The question is whether we as an international community accept the existence of a Jewish state with a right to secure borders like any other state, living as, a, as an accepted member of the community of nations. And that's not happening. Why is it not happening? Because you have a whole block of nations who for particular reasons have no interest in the existence of the state. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation and the Arab League are the driving forces behind all these resolutions and European nations and others are simply going along with this. And the reason we wrote this book is to help policymakers in our countries realise what is actually going on and that the world community would be benefited by having a strong state of Israel. And I think the Palestinians as well and the Arabs in the area will be benefited. The people of Gaza, before Israel pulled out in 2005, were fully part, had access to Israeli society. They were able to work in Israel. They were benefiting from the flourishing state of Israel. Now they've cut themselves off and look at the consequences. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see a solution for all the Arab peoples mm -hmm. and especially the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. But I believe it's through a strong democratic state of Israel that is governed by the rule of law that protects people.
The United Nations announced it selected an Israeli organization to receive its prestigious 2018 UN Population Award for outstanding contributions to the world's population. The UN said Save a Child's Heart has saved the lives of thousands of children with heart disease from around the world. Julie Stahl brings us this story that shows how Save a Child's Heart cardiac specialists traveled to East Africa. There they provided life-saving heart surgeries to desperately ill children in Tanzania, as well as to help train local doctors to carry on the work. Dar es Salaam is the largest city in the East African country of Tanzania. This is the Cardiac Institute at the Muambili Hospital in Dar es Salaam. Tanzania has 50 million people, yet it's the only place in the entire country that performs heart surgeries. Last year, the Jakaya Kowetti Cardiac Institute saw 25,000 patients and performed 270 surgeries. That's not nearly enough. Help is needed, and the Israeli organization Save a Child's Heart is answering the call by partnering with the Muhambili Hospital. At the Wolfson Medical Center, doctors give their time to save a child's heart. Over the years, they've saved the lives of more than 4,000 babies and children from Africa, South America, Asia, and the Middle East. And there's more. For us, just bringing children to Israel, it's nice, it's important, but it's not as good as treating them here at home. Cardiologist Dr. Sagi Asa is one of 35 doctors and other staff who brought their talent and care to Dar es Salaam for a week-long mission. For the healing process of a child, it is as important as the surgery itself. Uh, to be in your environment, treated by your physicians, speaking your language. They performed 12 surgeries, 21 other procedures, and screened 125 children for heart issues. That number included seven-month-old Whitney. She needed surgery to separate the blood vessels to her heart. CBN News received a rare opportunity to document the surgery performed by the team of Israeli and Tanzanian doctors. And if not treated at the first year of life, that might be irreversible. And this patient would grow up and die miserably at the age of about 20 or so. Whitney's mom, Lydia Ehilani, said she knew her daughter's case was uncommon. I was very scared and I asked, have you ever did an operation like that to the other kids apart from this? They said no. But at Isla, we used to do it. So they are going to be successful. And uh, that means that she would be able to live like a normal life, expectancy, have children, uh, uh, be like a normal child. But the work of Save a Child's Heart doesn't stop there. It's not the volume which counts here, it's that capacity building. And that's why you see the operations are complicated, but it's the locals who are doing with the supervision from the Israel team. Professor Mohammed Janabi, director of the Cardiac Institute, knows it's an uphill task. Because these operations, by our own, nobody could have tried to touch those kids. Having him coming here, and for the first time, uh, we did it together here, so that, uh, well, I'm hoping that uh, the next case I'll be able to do it by myself. Dr. Godwin Godfrey trained in Israel for five years. That helped prepare him for a busy schedule when he returned to Tanzania. I'm the only one who specializes in pediatric cardiac surgery department, but I have some help from uh, other cardiac surgeons who specialize like in adults and uh, vascular. Head surgeon of Save a Child's Heart, Dr. Lior Sasson, mentored Godfrey. I'm very proud because uh, now he assisted me, but in many other cases he did it uh, by himself. What we're looking at is, is the fruits and the results of a long training program in Israel where Israeli doctors have been training their colleagues from Tanzania. Save a Child's Heart Executive Director Simon Fisher said there's been a dramatic improvement in the complexity of the cases that Godfrey can handle. Missions like this, he said, bring the Tanzanian team closer to becoming independent. Until a year ago, Tanzanian children in need of heart surgery could not be treated inland. Um, the only opportunities were through surgery either in India um, or in Israel. This partnership is also giving both Israel and Tanzania 
an opportunity to take on negative perceptions. If you go out today and interview people, what do you know about Israel? Say, oh, they are the people who are shooting the Palestinians. No, 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 they are in Moimbili trying to do operations. If you interview 10 people today, trust me, maybe one will believe your story. And it's the same thing that uh, many people come to Africa, they don't think if they'll find cars, roads and everything. They always think about they'll find people starving and living in the jungles and what. So it's really about the image that is portrayed. Randy Weiss recruits volunteers and spends a lot of time keeping the children happy. She hopes the good work done here and other places will help get the word out, not only about this organization, but Israel as well. There's so much negativity associated with Israel and especially any kind of news that comes out of Israel. Um, and people tend to ignore all these wonderful things. Missions like these can help tip the scales. But I can guarantee you that their image of Israel changed after their child or their children received, uh, received surgery. Such was the case for this Muslim dad. I love Israel because he risked my son's life. Give me five. Yes, he's so good. And that says it all. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. We just saw how Save a Child's Heart Surgeons are saving hearts and lives. It's just one example of how Israelis are living out the Jewish concept of tikkun olam, healing the world. CBN documentaries chronicle this phenomenon in a new film called To Life, how Israeli volunteers are changing the world. If you'd like a copy of this inspiring movie, you can go to CBN.com. It's a great gift idea for your church, synagogue, or family. Well, that's all for this edition. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.